evening. Good evening. Welcome to worship as we finish this first Sunday of Advent, beginning it together in this place, now ending this very short midwinter uh, day, again gathering in God's presence to receive from him his word, but also to lift to him our praises. And tonight we're going to lift our praises in a special way. We've got some of our young people who have visited with some of our elderly and received from them some of their favorite songs. So we're going to sing some of those songs and hear a little bit about why they're favorites tonight. And their songs of the season as we enter this Advent season, some of these familiar Christmas carols that we long to sing, we'll have a chance to do that in praise of God tonight. And with those things before us, let's open the service, just quieting our hearts, bowing our heads, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Christmas season. And we ask that you would help us by your Holy Spirit to reclaim it and to be reclaimed. Heavenly Father, in a world that screams at us that our happiness is found in what we can buy and what we can gather, we pray that you would remind us that joy is found in what has been given to us and what you now enable us to share. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this evening you have gathered each of us safely in this place. And for those of us listening by internet or television or radio, we thank you that you are with each of your people here and around the world. Heavenly Father, we pray that tonight you would help to once again lift the burdens from our shoulders. That once again, you would open our eyes to behold you, our ears to hear from you. And that our lives would be so open to your Spirit's work that as we leave this place, we would be vessels that are filled to be poured out in a week of service. Father, we pray these things with thanksgiving and in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship? Our call to worship this evening are the opening verses of Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. The psalmist invites us to praise this God because he is great. Our opening song gives us voice to that. Number 483, How Great Thou Art.
Friends, the God that we proclaim is great as the God who also we, through faith, acknowledge is near with this word of greeting. May God our Father who loved us and by his eternal grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. May this God give you grace and peace tonight. Amen. As God has gathered us with grace and peace, would you please turn and share that grace and peace with those around you this evening. Friends, you may be seated, and we're going to enter this uh, a time of hymn singing again. Okay. A few weeks ago, the junior class had the, had the opportunity to go to Crown Point and Royal Meadows to visit with some of the residents there. They shared their favorite songs with us, either Christmas songs or regular songs. Harold Van de Keef said one of his favorite songs is How Great Thou Art, which was our opening song. One of Donna Obank's favorite Christmas songs is Joy to the World. She shared that everyone needs joy in this life and that our greatest joy is found in Jesus. Let us sing of that joy joyfully. Also, it is a Violet Hawk, who is a, not a member of Bethel. Stan Hawk, who is a member of Bethel, said that they aren't related that he knows of. He said that Violet's husband, Peter, was from a group different, a different group from North Dakota. Stan's grandpa came from the Netherlands as an only child after his parents died quite young, with only an unmarried uncle left in the old country. So there's not very many relatives, Hawk relatives. A favorite song from Violet Hawk was Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone, which is one that we liked too. As we have the guitar and piano playing for this song, we thought it was neat that Clara Hoagland shared that she used to play guitar and Priscilla Brooke enjoyed playing the piano. Priscilla added that she is convinced her youngest son is musical because she didn't have as much pressure to play the piano as their other children did. She said that she was tired of forcing her kids into piano lessons that she taught. So let's sing that song and thank God for the musical talents of our youth today and those who led the way before us.
last song and a favorite Christmas song of both Marie Fetters and Phyllis Wissink is Silent Night. They're especially hoping to have a silent night after all the excitement of the mouse in the house, like the seniors heard about and shared last month. So let's sing that song together, thankful for that first silent night when Jesus was born, but also thankful for hopefully more silent nights at Crown Point and Royal Meadows. For us, I'd like to invite any boys and girls up for a children's sermon as we prepare to go to God's Word. Welcome to come up for a children's sermon. Just noting we are shifting back. I do shower every Sunday morning or Saturday night, so you guys don't have to be afraid to come up. It's always wonderful to have you uh, boys and girls at church, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about food. So I want to ask, how many of you are hungry right now? All right. So anyone have supper already, or do you have to eat supper yet? You're all pretty hungry? Good. I've got some food. I want to just, you have to, I don't have enough for you to have bowls, so you have to make a choice. So I've got, um, here I've got Country Hearth 12 grain whole wheat bread, so you can have that, or I've got double stuff Oreos. So um, I don't have enough. You can't have both. You have to pick one or the other. How many want the 12 grain plain whole wheat bread? Raise your hand. We got, we got one taker. How about the devil stuff Oreos? It seems that's, why? Why do you guys want the Oreos? Isn't this nice bread? Look at this bread. It's good stuff. Why would you want Oreos? Anyone? Why? They're more tastier. More tastier. Yes, that's good. So, is anyone else, is that kind of what you're thinking? The Oreos a little bit taste better? Or is that, any other reason you want Oreos? Maybe because your parents don't buy them for you? You need to marry a wife, she'll buy them for you. So, yeah. Because there's two surprises in 
There's two surprises in one, yes. And you, can, you, and you can lick them, put them together. You can't do that with bread. You lick bread, it just gets in your tongue, right? So when you get food, often we're not picking it um, based on what's in it. Because actually, if you read on the back, you guys, can you read what's on the back of this? These are called nutrition labels. You can read this. And this is called a not nutrition label because there's nothing good in Oreos. We don't usually pick our food, though, based on what's in it. We pick our food based on what we like to eat. And we're going to be talking today about food, and um, there's actually another way you can get the same nutrition. Um, how many of you guys take vitamins? Does anyone take vitamins? I see some uh, not good faces. These, this is nutrition in a small form. And we're going to be talking today about the Lord's Supper. And we eat the Lord's Supper, we'll be doing that next week, Sunday, not because the food tastes so good. It's just bread, right? And you guys don't like bread. It's not that it tastes so good, but because we believe that in that food, just like in vitamins, there's things that we need. And that this Lord's Supper is not like an Oreo cookie that you're going to eat um, for fun, but it's something you're going to eat because it makes you stronger. And that's why we take the Lord's Supper next week, Sunday. And as you watch that next week, Sunday, I want you to think what your parents are doing when they're also getting nutrition, sp spiritual nutrition from the food they're going to eat. Okay? Does that make sense? We'll be talking about that tonight. Um, as you go to your, uh, ch uh, your place, you can each grab, I think hopefully there's enough here, at one double stuff Oreo. I also have candy if there's not enough there. Or if you want, you can grab a piece of bread. So, But there's your Oreos and your candy. Um, and you can grab one as you go back to your seats. Yeah. And as the boys and girls are getting fed nutritious, wholesome snacks in church, uh, let's turn to God's Word. I invite you to turn with me tonight. We're going to be in the Gospel of John, in chapter 6, and we're going to be reading just the, a few verses of a longer sermon of Jesus in John, chapter 6. We're also going to be in two different parts of the Heidelberg Catechism, two Lord's Day, Lord's Day 28 and 29, and those are found on page 893 through 896 in your Grace Altar Hymnals, on the Heidelberg Catechism, and also uh, John chapter 6. If you are a guest with us, we are walking through this old teaching of the church, and we're in the section where it's describing what the sacraments are, those, these things that God has given us to show us his grace. And we began with a sermon looking at what sacraments are, and we saw that sacraments are tools of the Holy Spirit. So they're not magical things in themselves. They're gracious ways that God works. They're his tools. We call them means of grace that are both signs and seals. They're signs in that they point to the sacrifice, and they're seals in that they help us participate in Christ's sacrifice. That was the opening sermon. And then we spent two weeks now on baptism. Reverend Tinklenberg described what baptism is, and then last week, Sunday, we looked at who should receive baptism. We saw it's believers and their children. And we're going to do that same pattern now with the Lord's Supper. Tonight, we're going to see what is communion, and then next week, Sunday, we're going to see who should participate. So that same pattern we follow with baptism, we're going to follow with communion. And as we do that, I'm going to read the teachings of the church. Um, there's a lot of question and answers tonight. I'm going to read um, the question about you to join me and the answers for all but one of them. So first of all, question and answer 75. How does the Lord's Supper remind you and assure you that you share in Christ one sacrifice on the cross and in all his gifts? In this way, Christ has commanded me and all believers to eat this broken bread and to drink this cup. And with this command, he gave this promise. First, as surely as I see with my eyes the bread of the Lord broken for me and the cup given to me, so surely his body was offered and broken for me and his blood poured out for me on the cross. Second, as surely as I receive from the hand of the one who serves and taste with my mouth the bread and the cup of the Lord, given me as sure signs of Christ's body and blood, so surely he nourishes and refreshes my soul for eternal life with his crucified body and poured out blood. Now question answer 76. What does it mean to eat the crucified body of Christ, and to drink his poured out blood. It means to accept with a believing heart the entire suffering and death of Christ, and by believing to receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But it means more. 
Through the Holy Spirit, who lives both in Christ and in us, we are united more and more to Christ's blessed body. And so, although he is in heaven and we are on earth, we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. And we forever live on and are governed by one spirit, as members of our body are by one soul. Then question answer 76 asks, where does Christ promise to nourish and refresh believers with his body and blood as surely as they eat this broken bread and drink this cup? So where is that promise? The answer, in the institution of the Lord's Supper, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me. And the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This promise is repeated by Paul in these words, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ, and is not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. And then moving to the two questions of Lord's Day 29, are the bread and the wine changed into the real body and blood of Christ? No. Just as the water of baptism is not changed into Christ's blood and does not itself wash away sins, but is simply God's sign and assurance, so too the bread of the Lord's Supper is not changed into the actual body of Christ, even though it is called the body of Christ, in keeping with the nature and language of sacraments. And then one more. Why then does Christ call the bread his body? in the cup his blood, or the new covenant in his blood. Paul uses the words of participation in Christ's body and blood. Christ has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that as bread and wine nourish our temporal life, so too his crucified body and poured out blood truly nourish our souls for eternal life. But more important, he wants to assure us by his visible sign and pledge that we, through the Holy Spirit's work, share in his true body and blood, as surely as our mouths receive these holy signs in his remembrance, and that all of his sufferings and obedience are as definitely ours as if we personally had suffered and paid for our sins. A lot of teaching from the church we're going to try to work through briefly this evening. As we turn to God's word, which is the source of that teaching, let's pray for God to speak. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are mindful of our weakness. And so rather than hoping for us to find who you are, you have revealed yourself through your word. And rather than waiting for us to grasp the depth of your word only through our minds, you have given us these tangible expressions of grace that you have called the sacraments. Heavenly Father, as we reflect on the gift that is the Lord's Supper and prepare our hearts to receive this gift next week, Sunday evening, we pray that you would shape our expectation, that you would create in us a deep and holy hunger for you and for your word and for Christ. And Lord, that you would unite us to Christ already now as you gather us around your living word. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And read John chapter 6. I'm actually going to begin at verse 51 just to give a little context. Jesus is speaking here as part of a longer sermon. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If a man eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. 
This is the bread that came down from heaven. Our forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, I'd like to begin today reflecting with a question about food. Often the question we ask about food is the question, what should we eat? And maybe this holiday season we ask the question, how much should I eat? But tonight I don't want to reflect on what we should eat or how much we should eat, but the deeper question, why do we eat? Why do we eat? And when we think about that, it seems simple, but there's actually a variety of answers, a variety of reasons why. At one level, we eat based on an instinctual desire. That each of us experiences discomfort, a gnawing sensation, and it can even go towards pain. We call that hunger, and we eat because that's the only way that we can get rid of that negative sensation. Babies are not philosophers, and yet they cry out to eat because of that negative physical drive that pushes us to eat. But that's not the only reason. We also have a positive reason that draws us to food, and that would be taste. Sometimes we eat not at all because we're miserable and need to eat, but because it's pleasurable to eat. And we can look at a well-done steak or beautiful array of whole wheat bread, and we can just long to eat it, can't we? Is anyone hungry right now? It's not just the negative, it's also the pleasure. But there's another reason we eat, and that's the social aspect. Because eating is a fundamental human activity Eating is also a fundamental part of human society. And sometimes we eat because that's how we're bonded to one another in groups. These are all different reasons for that, answering the question, why do we eat? But below them all, there's the deepest reason. And that is, of course, because food has within it, by God's design, invisible nutrients that are the building blocks of our life. If we don't eat, we die. If we do eat, we live. Why do we eat? Because it's a matter of life and death, and we need this nutrition. Now with that in front of us, I want to ask us this question tonight, the theological question, why do we eat? Is it because we have some deep, innate drive that we find ourselves spiritually starving, a gnawing power in our belly that drives us to want to take communion? Is that this reason? Is it the sensation that drives us? Do we eat because the taste of the bread and of the juice is just so wonderful, we're drawn to the flavor? Do we eat because of the social aspect, that gathering around the table helps us remember that we're part of a bigger body? Or beneath each of those reasons, is there a deeper reason? Could it be that there is some sort of spiritual nutrition in what we eat that has the matter of life and death bound up in it? Could it be that we actually need to eat and drink if we would like to live? That's the question before us. Why this supper? And to answer that question, we turn to John chapter 6, which is a chapter all about food. In the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a, a story in each of them where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. It's Matthew 26, it's early in Mark, it's Luke 22. John doesn't have a story of the Lord's Supper. At his last supper, Jesus washes feet, doesn't, he doesn't give a bread and a cup. But earlier in John 6, John describes the theology that would be the same as the Lord's Supper. And in this chapter, if you've got your Bible open, you'll see at the beginning, what's happening is the feeding of the 5,000. There's a crowd, there's a little boy with five loaves and two fish. Jesus multiplies it, he feeds the 5,000. Then he gets in a boat, he crosses the lake, the crowd follows him, he lands, and when he sees the crowd, he rebukes them with these words in verse 26. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. This is clear proof in scripture that there were college kids in the audience of Jesus. They're looking for free food. And Jesus in the next verse points them to something deeper. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. At that point, the crowd kind of pushes back and they say, we want a sign. Now Moses gave a sign. He gave us bread called manna. What are you going to give us? Again, they're fixated on food. And Jesus rebukes them again. 
Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. And then the crowd says, okay, give us this bread. And Jesus, for the first time in John's gospel, says the first of the seven I am statements. And the first of those seven is this. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never grow hungry. Jesus said, I am that food. And then through the rest of this sermon, Jesus is interacting with the people. He says, whoever comes to me, and he's describing why people come, that the Father has to draw them, and who they're coming to. And the sermon goes on, and it's very evangelistic. But then at the end, Jesus gets a little bit prophetic, and he he gets a little bit hard to understand. Because in verse 51, he moves from this kind of evangelistic, how do you come to Christ, to this very difficult saying, I am not just the bread, but I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now at that point in the sermon, this crowd who had been struggling to understand him, loses him. In the very next verse, then some of the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us flesh to eat? Remember, Jews keep the dietary laws. They have clean foods and unclean foods. And if a Jew will not eat bacon, they're certainly not going to eat a rabbi. And in Leviticus, you do not eat meat with blood in it. Jesus is saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood. This is scandalous and it's disgusting. And the Jews want nothing to do with it. But then Jesus doubles down in the very next verse. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats, and then he changes the verb, the verb underline eats, that's a different verb, which actually means to chew loudly, like a cow munching a cud. He is pushing this image on them. You need to chow down on my flesh. And drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. And so Jesus is drawing this to a head, and he's saying, you need to eat me, and you need to drink my blood. Now, what do we do with this sermon? Well, one of the ways you could take it is the way the original audience did, that what Jesus is advocating here is cannibalism. That he is saying, literally, you need to eat this stuff on my skin. You need to chow down on my flesh. And you need to gobble up, gurgle down my blood. But of course, that's not what he's saying. But if you don't take Jesus literally, and remember, we read scripture carefully, not literally. If you don't take Jesus literally, then you could take him symbolically. And you could say what's going on in John 6 is Jesus is pointing to the cross. And what shows us that that's what's going on here is the fact of how he makes it an absolute statement. What I've just shown you, that passage, he says, if you do not eat this flesh, you will not live. So he can't be talking only about the Lord's Supper, because if he's saying that, that's that's Jesus saying, if you never take the supper, you won't go to heaven, which of course isn't true. And it's saying, and if you take the supper, automatically you're in, which of course is not true. This, in John 6, is pointing us to the cross. And what Jesus is saying here is that salvation will cost the life of the Savior. His flesh and blood will need to be poured out. And for someone to be saved, they need to be united to that Savior as if they take his flesh and blood into themselves. He's pointing us to the cross. It's symbolic teaching. But it's also something else. It's also sacramental. Because John, in his framing of it, is not only pointing us to the cross, he's pointing us to the supper that reminds us of the cross. We see that in the way that this chapter is framed. Remember, it's a chapter on food and how is, where is the context of this? Chapter 6, verse 4, the Jewish Passover feast was near. This teaching on Jesus as the living bread is framed by Passover. That's the Lord's Supper. John is pointing us to this feast. But not only that, what John is saying in John 6 parallels what Matthew, Mark, and Luke say. John says, and as Jesus saying, my flesh is real food, And in the other Gospels, he says, this is my body. It's the same thing. My flesh is real bread. This bread is my flesh. This is the institution in John of the Lord's Supper. 
And if that's true, then we ask that question, why are we to eat? And Jesus is giving us two reasons. Certainly one of them is his command. We do this because he's told us to. He says, take and eat, take and drink, remember and believe, do this in remembrance of me. Those are all imperatives. Why do we do this? Because we're told to. But John goes beyond duty to describe the deeper meaning. And the second reason we do this is because it is life or death nourishment. John says the reason we come to this meal is not just because we have to, but because we need to. Notice again the language of John chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. That's death. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, life or death. This is real food, he says, and you really need it. So why do we eat this meal? Because he's commanded it and because we need the nutrition. And that's exactly what the, t- the church has said in these Heidelberg Catechism questions and answers. Do you notice, why do we eat? Command. Heidelberg Q&A 75, Christ has commanded me and all believers to eat this broken bread and to drink this cup, but also nourishment. With this command, he gave this promise, as surely as I see before me um, the bread, so surely the cross happened, right? But then secondly, as surely as I receive from the hand of the one who serves and taste with my mouth the bread and the cup of the Lord given me as a sure sign of Christ's body and blood, so surely he what? nourishes and refreshes my soul for eternal life with his crucified body and poured out blood. The catechism says, why do we do this? Because we need it. I want us to reflect on that answer to the question why and then reflect on how we approach this table. Because my sense is most of us don't approach next week's Sunday evening with that sense. In fact, I'm going to guess here that next week's Sunday morning, We'll have a lot more, these pews will be filled. We'll probably have some people over there. But next week, Sunday night, when we're going to have this meal that Jesus says we need, my guess is we'll have about what we have tonight, maybe a little bit less. Because we're not actually that sure that Jesus knows what he's talking about. As a pastor, I get to visit some of our elderly people. And it strikes me that maybe something about approaching death clarifies spiritually our thinking. And every once in a while, actually, with some regularity, I'll be talking to some of our members in care facilities around, and they'll ask me if I can bring them communion. People who aren't in Royal Meadows, we serve that every time, each, each time we serve. But in other places, they don't, and they say, could you please bring it? Because they have a sense deep in their soul, after years of being formed, that this is something they need. But I've never yet had a young person or a middle-aged person tell me, you know, Pastor John, I just wish we did this more often. I'm hungry for it. That's not how we approach the table. In fact, we've moved recently from only four times a year of having this to once a month. And yet there's some of us who have some questions about that. And those are good questions and it's good to dialogue. But the reasons that are behind our questions so far have not been based on the teachings of the church. John Calvin wanted it every week. It's not based on church history. It's not based on church theology. It's based on feelings. I like it to be more special, which is understandable. But the argument something to be, should be special is an argument you use with a Christmas sweater. You know those ugly ones, I only wear that once a year, it's special? You don't use that argument with something you need. No one says, you know, I try to eat a meal, you know, I try to eat maybe once a week, it's just really special that way. No, you eat three times a day because you're hungry. And Jesus says that's what this meal is supposed to be. Something we recognize Our life depends on what it involves us in. Why is that? Why could Jesus say that? It's because of what the Lord's Supper actually is. And there's different understandings. Some of our brothers and sisters in Christ, the Catholics and the Lutherans, say that these elements actually are literal participation in Christ. This is literally feeding on Christ. Catholics have something called transubstantiation, where they believe that this bread changes into the body of Christ and the cup changes into the blood. Our Lutheran friends say the elements don't change, but that Christ, not just spiritual presence, but that his physical body is in, around, and through the elements. And the reason they say that is because of what they read in John chapter 6, where Jesus said, 
This, my flesh is real food and my body is real drink. Or in Matthew 26, this bread is my body. They say, look, this has to be literally Jesus. That's why you need it, because you're eating Jesus. Reformed Christians have said, not so fast. Notice what we read in the Heidelberg Catechism. Are the bread and the wine changed into the real body and blood of Christ? No. Just as the water of baptism is not changed into Christ's blood and does not itself wash away sins, but is simply a sign and assurance, so too the bread of the Lord's Supper is not changed into the actual body of Christ, even though it's called the body of Christ. We're saying that's not the reason. Well, then on the other extreme, there are people who are maybe more evangelical who say, well, if this is not literal, then maybe this is simply symbolic, memorial, that this is a memorial feast, that this is simply an object lesson, which is why if you go to most communion tables in Protestant churches, what does it say across the front? Does anyone know? Do this in remembrance. Most of us come to the table, is it simply a reminder? And that's why we don't want to do it too often. Because if you get reminded of something too often, it becomes background noise, right? And that's what Jesus said, this is remembrance. But that's why John 6 is so important because it's more than simple remembrance. That's why Reformed theologians, all the way back from John Calvin to the present, say that it is not just remembrance, that it is real spiritual nourishment, not just for our minds, but for our bodies and souls. Notice again what we read. Why then does Christ call the bread his body, the cup his blood? Christ has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that as bread and wine nourish our temporal life, so too. His crucified body and poured out blood truly nourish our souls for eternal life. One of my seminary professors says this, the communion elements do not merely symbolize the strengthening of faith. For the person who has any faith at all, these elements actually make faith stronger. The faith which may be slipping or wobbling is secured and stabilized. It is a nourishing meal to produce muscular faith. Or to quote another 21st century theologian, the real food and real drink of real life is Jesus' flesh. Sacrificed on the cross for the sin of the world, trusted with hearts of faith, and imbibed spiritually in the Lord's Supper, no food on the planet is more nourishing to the whole human person than the bread and wine of the church worship service. For this food gives not only remembrance of the gospel, but the gospel itself, Jesus Christ himself. That's what we believe this is. Jesus meeting with us in a real way. How does that happen? Well, the catechism tells us what's really going on. Q&A 76. What does it mean to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink his poured out blood? It means to accept with a believing heart. This is a meal of faith. Through the Holy Spirit, this is a tool of the Spirit. It's not magic in itself. This is a means of grace where God is flowing. But what does the Holy Spirit do? He lives in Christ and in us, and we are united more and more to Christ's blessed body. And so that through, though he is in heaven and we are on earth, we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. The next week, Sunday, when you take the cup and you take the bread, we believe as Reformed Christians, you're not simply reminded but in that moment, Christ is spiritually present. And as surely as you take the bread with its nutrients into your body, spiritually you are being strengthened and nourished. And we need that nourishment. You could say the reason we eat and drink, the, the way we're nourished, is not because we feast on Christ, but because we are united to Christ. That's the Lord's Supper. What's the take home? What's the beauty of that? It means that in this place, next week, Sunday, and every month, God meets with his people in a special way. This whole story that we've just read in John chapter 6, this sermon took place, we're told in, in verse 29, at a synagogue in Capernaum. Capernaum was a backwater town. That makes Dune, Iowa look like some metropolis. And yet in that place, Jesus said, this is where you can have my bread. My, my flesh, and you can drink my blood, even here. And I'd like to close with a story that captures that truth today. It's a story of something that happened on June 20, 1969, when a man named Buzz Lightyear, no, Buzz Aldrin, Buzz Aldrin, 
who you may not know was like us. He was Presbyterian, so it's Reformed. And before he went to the moon with Neil Armstrong, he talked to his priest about how he could celebrate landing on the moon. This was the first landing on the moon, the first time that human beings would be there. And so they landed on the moon with a lunar capsule, and they had six hours between landing and when they took that first small step for man. And during those six hours, Buzz Aldrin, a believer in Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in his heart, flying to the moon just with the spaceship, reached into his personal belongings, and he took out something that he had brought with him. Let's listen to Buzz's voice. In the radio blackout, I opened the little plastic package which contained the bread and the wine. I poured the wine into the chalice our church had given me. In the one-sixth gravity of the moon, the wine slowly curled and gracefully came up the side of the cup. Then I read the scripture. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me will bring forth much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Uniting to Christ. I gave thanks for the intelligence and spirit that had brought two young pilots to the Sea of Tranquility. It was interesting for me to think that the very first liquid ever poured on the moon and the very first food eaten there were the communion elements. Even on the dark side of the moon and in all the places that we will find ourselves in life each month that we gather, God knows what we need and he meets with his people. That is what the Lord's Supper is. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we confess that we have taken this gift and we have so often distorted it. We have turned it into a sign of spiritual privilege that we have somehow earned the ability to come to your table because of our goodness and our righteousness, because we have had some sort of dream or have somehow accomplished something for you. And we have lost sight that this is an invitation that comes to us not through our deserving, but through Christ's sacrifice. Holy Father, we confess also that we have come to this table so often, seeing it as a duty to be done infrequently, as simply a tool for our minds to be reminded and not for our souls to be truly fed. Father, we thank you for this troubling, wondrous sermon of Jesus and the mystery that he unfolds to us, that this supper points us to the cross, but also enables us by your spirit to join with Christ and to so be nourished and strengthened in him. Father, we pray that you would help prepare our hearts for next week. We ask this in Jesus' name and all of us say, amen. The song of response speaks of the hunger that we truly have, whether we feel it or not. Let's sing together, all who hunger, gather gladly.
With that reminder that God is good, you may be seated and we come to him in prayer. And as we do, are there any prayer requests to share tonight of celebration or of petition? And if not, we'll go right to prayer, but any, I just want to give a space. All right, let's, let's bow our heads together and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the means of grace. For the flowing waters of baptism which come to new believers and to children of believers. Reminding us that the story of Noah and the flood where you through the ark bore your redeemed people from judgment into safety. That through waters you once again involve us in this story of redemption. And Lord, we thank you for the simplicity of loaves of bread and for little cups of juice that remind us of this great story of redemption. That point us to the cross but also help us by your Holy Spirit join with Jesus who died on the cross for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you as a congregation for the work that goes on through the ministries of this congregation. We thank you for the elders and deacons who serve with wisdom and with gentleness. We pray that you continue to lead the council as they make decisions as we look to a new year. Father, we thank you for the staff of this church. We thank you for each of the gifts that you've given our staff members and for how they're used selflessly and with excellence and with dedication. Holy Father, as we thank you for the staff you've given, we do continue to pray that you'll bring us to the person you're choosing as a new youth director. Lord, we know that you already are preparing that person. We pray that as a congregation, you would prepare us as well, and that in your time, you would connect us up, that, Lord, you would fill this position, and that you would be glorified in a new season of ministry as a congregation. Holy Father, we're thankful for our care and concern group coordinators who serve as gentle shepherds among us, bringing meals, offering prayer, words of encouragement through notes. And we thank you that you've called these women to this task, and we pray that you would also, even as some new women are preparing to take up the, the call next month, that you would give them a new measure of your strength and your anointing. Holy Father, we're thankful for the committees of this church, for those working with church education programs and Christian education funding those working with mission and evangelism, helping to champion outreach to our community and our world. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the Hospitality Committee, which serves as an open door of welcome to all that you would bring to worship with us. Father, in each of these committees and others, we pray that you would continue your work, whether through behind the scenes, preparing coffee, or in the building committee, fixing broken things, or through those who serve with music and planning worship and leading through song and instruments. Lord, we thank you for each gift. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you'll continue in this new week to watch over us even as the weather grows colder and as snow may fall and the roads may turn slick. May you command your angels concerning each of us and our families to guard us in all of our ways. Heavenly Father, as we pray this, we also thank you tonight for our, our young people and for the chance we can have to gather with them at a bake sale on Wednesday. We thank you for their interaction with our elderly through this hymn sing. And Father, we pray that young and old, men and women, married and single, Together, we would find our place shoulder to shoulder around the table next week, Sunday. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are a God who doesn't just call us to worship, but then empowers us to worship you with word and deed in our lives. Father, we pray that you would bless our farming and our parenting and our teaching, the work that we do in offices and in factories and in agriculture and agribusiness, Lord, in all the ways in this week that you will use us. We pray that you would give us eyes to see what you're doing and to join you gladly. Lord, this would be a week in which you put words in our mouths to share with coworkers and extended family and neighbors who don't know you. Lord, that we would give a reason for the hope within us. Father, may you move us with a zeal with Christ to invite people to come. Heavenly Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to work in this church, that you would pour out your gifts among this body, or that you would stir the gifts you've already given to new, new flame and new measure. We even dedicate the prayer room as we're continuing to work and to think about that space. May you call us to be a people of prayer, both corporately and individually, Lord, as we live in a world that is so in need of you. May you continually invite us to our knees, to, to words of, of speaking and also to even groans that words cannot express. Heavenly Father, we do pray for those with special needs in this congregation. We pray for Neil and Trina. We just thank you for a recent anniversary, and yet we pray that you would bless Neil as he cares for his wife. Heavenly Father, we pray for the families of this congregation that are strained in this holiday season. We ask that you would be a reconciler, that you would soften hearts, that you would help us as a body not to gossip or to judge, but to come alongside of the hurting 
And Lord, may you through our lives and through our words speak and walk beside. Heavenly Father, receive our offerings now as well. We give these through faith. We give them in confidence and as expressions of our role as stewards, that all that we have is yours, all that we are and do is yours. And so with gratitude and trust, we now turn back to you our praise. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offering tonight is for Mission India. It's an organization we've partnered with for many years and have supported generously who plant churches through Indian church planters all over that subcontinent. And may God bless us and our gifts as we give tonight. Would you please stand as we finish the service? We will be reminded of the faith that we profess, but also that we share with believers around the word, world through the Apostles' Creed. Let's say together, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And friends, on this first Sunday of Advent, where we're reminded of God's gift of hope, receive this parting blessing from 2 Thessalonians 2. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, 
May he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Go in peace and in hope to love and to serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you.